Hello, this is meeting number 25 of the Cyclog group for visual tools in Clojure. And it is kind of a continuation of our learning of HTMX and related tools and libraries. Last time we had Adam talking about uh, a bad spreadsheet, uh, as it is called nowadays, and it was so enlightening. And then Mark had a few comments last time about, about what Mark has been doing. So now we, we are kind of lucky that Mark kindly agreed to talk today about uh, a certain tool uh, he has been creating with HTMX and Clojure. And uh, we are now, uh, Nicolas and Olaf and Tim and uh, Adam and Mark and Nikita and Kartik and Daniel, and uh, probably a couple of other friends will join. And uh, yeah, uh, if you wish, Mark, uh, it would be great to begin and tell something about yourself and, and present. Thank you so much. Sounds great. I'm glad I can be here today and talk about uh, a little project I've been working on, some HGMX stuff. Um, so I'm Mark Bastian. I'm from uh, uh, the Idaho area in the U.S. Um, I've been doing closure for probably about 10 years and then doing professional development for over 20. Um, I stumbled upon HTMX, oh, I don't know, maybe a year ago. Been doing that. I really like it. And so I'll just be talking about uh, about that today. Mostly I'll be going over a project that I've been working on as kind of just a fun little side project. And then, so HTMX is probably going to come a little bit later on, but we'll dive into the code and, and take a look at everything. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, okay, I tried to blow up some of the fonts and stuff. Hopefully you all can see this. If you have any problems, let me know and I'll try to, try to make things a little bigger. Um, and by the way, I usually, when it comes to uh, Zoom, I am very bad at watching the, uh, the comments. So if somebody wouldn't mind just if any questions or anything pop up, somebody wants to monitor that for me uh, and, and say something and feel free to interrupt at any point in time if you would like um, with any questions or anything. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, okay, so let's jump right in. Yeah, what I wanted to- I think yes. it would be nice to Zoom a little bit. Uh, to zoom okay. If you can, thanks. Let me see. Uh, Command plus, there we go. Make it even bigger. How's that? Yeah, beautiful, thank you. And I may need to, I'm on a, I'm on a larger monitor. So at any point in time, if you need to, if you need to make things bigger, let me know. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do is show this tool first. And I even dropped a link in the chat. And let's right, step one is gonna find the chat. Uh, I dropped the link in the chat. If you don't mind going and cloning that repo, if you want to follow along, if not, it's okay. Um, I'm using local tunnel to expose the uh, the endpoint. It is, I've noticed today the the networking is not super fast, so hopefully it will work. But I expect it to not be the the fastest experience in the world. Um, can't see the repo. Thing. Okay, uh, and then you should also all be able to go here and log in right now and create an account. Uh, let me see. Is this? Try that again. Maybe I dropped the wrong link. Hopefully you can reach the link. Is that, can it, can it, is there anybody that's not able to reach that link that I dropped or? For me, it works. It works. Okay. All right. So I'll uh, I'll, I'll let you all work on that on the side. Uh, just clone it and then um, and, and then wait. And then for right now, you can go ahead and click here and sign up if you have access to the this URL right here that I also dropped in the chat. Okay. So let me jump in here and just kind of give a demo of what Keg Party is. The original idea was um, I wanted to have some kind of a cap target where I could you know tap in my code and show my data, be able to like navigate around and do stuff with it. And a lot of the demos that you see out there for like web sockets or you know, pick your technology are about like making a basic chat server. And I thought, well, how can I make it a little more interesting? Well, maybe we could actually make it like a party REPL style thing where you tap and other people, you know, you all can connect to it and go in and, and instead of being chat messages, it's, it's data from tap. And so that's the basic idea. Kind of the reality is that at this point, um, it's more just me doing my own thing. And so we'll test out the ability to do the chat thing, but I'll show the tool first. And then if we want to try to 
try to more do, do the, uh, the, the, the party connection we can. Um, let's see, so let me just log in here. All right, so whenever I uh, start up in my, so I'm going over here to my little project, let me hide the chat and move this out of my way. Okay, so whenever I start up a project, what I will do is I have this little code that does tapping. And so I actually made this uh, keg party demo project. And if you all want to clone or try to make it run the background, or you can just follow along, don't worry about it, whatever. Um, <clears throat> the idea, you can see that my REPL just launched and it said tapping in. So it just sent a tap. Um, and I'm going to go through here and just kind of go step by step over, over how to set this up. And it's actually really easy. So the first thing you're going to do is you're going to run the keg party server itself. And I'm actually going to save that for later. There's a couple of one-liner ways of doing it. It's pretty easy. Um, and then to actually connect, what you do is if you have your own, like a user profile in your application, then you can just go in here. And the only thing you need to do is include the keg party rest client, and then you can do keg party tap in. And so when you tap in, it'll tap in, and then you can go ahead and start tapping. And I'll just show that I can tap a few more times and uh do oh, that uh, mark i'll stop you for a moment because yes. probably we need to say something about login okay about logging in right because uh, uh, uh we may need to add ourselves as a user right to sign up and so yes on. and so once we get to the point where we kind of i haven't really got to the party mode yet but this is a good time to kind of preface it so if you want to sign up i'll go ahead and I got the zoom right here. Okay. If you want to sign up, uh, let's see. I think the, unfortunately, I think the local tunnel is being kind of slow right now. You should be able to go sign up and then create a username. Uh, this is me, password. Oops. Uh, Um, Mark, I I see um, something a little different here. It says to access the website, please enter the tunnel password below. That's what I'm seeing oh, anyway. Not... Yes. Uh... Hang on just a sec. Is there a link that says, um, ah, shoot, how do I, let me start up again. Oh, and in fact, I don't know, the local tunnel is running right now. That may be part of the problem. Um, it says here on the link uh, that if you're the developer, you need to go to locate.it slash my tunnel password uh, to get the password. Can you drop that link in the chat? Uh, let's see. Uh, I'll try to share my screen so you can see. Because there's like uh, instructions for the... Post. Yeah, I've seen that before. It's just not sending me to the right place. Do you see my screen? Um, yeah. Okay, here like we go. All right, here it is. We got it. And by the way, we're going to use Keg Party 1, not Keg Party. So.
Aber das hier nicht. Okay. Give that a shot. See if it works. Hopefully. That uh, seemed to work on my end. All right. Success. Okay, so you should be able to go and create a uh, create an account. <clears throat> Hopefully, it will not be too terribly slow. Um, I, I have noticed with local tunnel, it can be a little laggy. Um, once you have created your username and password, then you should be able to go into whatever tool you've got and set your environment. And these really here are the only three environment variables you're gonna need. Only we are going to be using again to remind you. In fact, I'll paste these right here in the chat. Uh, if I can find the chat. So whatever username and password you set up, of course, remove the commas, uh, the comments and, uh, and then use that URL. And then, so if you set those environment variables, launch the project, um, then you should actually be able to either evaluate this form manually or, um, you know, or, or if you have it set up with the user dev to, uh, to connect. There's one other piece. Since we're, go we're going a little, a little out of order, people are already trying to tap in. That's, that's good. That's a good thing. Um, the way I use Keg Party is I have an alias, and I've got documentation on this on the website for it, but like I have a Mark Bastion dev and... It will have uh, see this one right here. And so notice that it has an extra path of dev. So that's going to pull that dev uh, namespace or package into the folder into the project. And then here I have the keg party client. The other things down here, they're not particularly relevant. I'll just drop this in the chat and people can parse that as they will. And if you actually go to the keg party website, There is a some information on kind of on all this right here. And I believe I have some information on Let's see the, the other pages on the on the server setup, but basically for setting up your client, this is really all you need to do. And then um, adding the uh, the extra depths here, like I just pasted in here, is a good is a good way to do it. So let me know if that's working or not working. Um, but really, ultimately, it's add the add the client. However you want, add that username space or however you want to tap in, do that. So you can either do like this one right here where there's the extra depths. Hey, there's people. I see people here. That's great. I don't know if you've tapped in or just signed up. So it sort of, it, it must work. Um, all right. Once you've tapped in, let me go over here and show you kind of how it works. Can't connect. Um, I don't know if anyone else minds, like I know Adam and Nikita looks like you've kind of been able to get in. Maybe if, if any of you want to um, uh, maybe, try, maybe try to help async, that would be great. Uh, I know as far as logging in, if you just go to the login page and then there's a sign up right there, that's how you do it, that sign up link. Um, so let me start demoing the, the, the project. And if any of you, if I start seeing taps from people, then I know that you have succeeded. Um, hmm. Yeah, um, Mark, uh, sorry for stopping you again. Would it make hey, no sense to, to try to debug if any of us are not connected yet? Would you like to kind of make it interactive and, and debug? Yeah, we could do that. If anyone else wants to you know, share their screen or talk through it, I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, and so let's see, let me just make sure for any of you, I know a lot of it sounds like you're having trouble if anyone else is. I don't, I'm trying to remember if these names that have showed up, like if you've actually tapped in already or if you've just signed up for an account. 
um, maybe you've just signed up. Um, as far as tapping in, there are a couple of ways you can do it. And maybe the easiest thing to do is you could modify this depths Eden if you want. Um, let me go grab again the, the fragment um, from the... Yeah, maybe even oh, before that? tapping in, uh, what do you think, Olaf? Olaf, would you like to share your screen for a moment and we can explore this? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll try. Yeah, thank Let's you. Let's see. Thank you. Mm -hmm. To share screen. Yeah, since we have a lot uh, of time and we can yeah. do things in the editing afterwards, it would be kind well, of... My, 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 dream, my dream is to have like a actual live running uh, you know, no, you know, server out in the cloud, and then maybe like do this interactively at the con or something. So this is a great way to oh, smooth wow. out all the problems. <laughs> yeah. Mm, it, is my screen visible? Um, not yet. I'm not seeing it yet. Right. Let's see. Uh, is it visible now? It is. Yeah. Yes. Um, let's see. So here's the where I go. Uh, it's just four oh four. Uh oh oh uh add a add the number the digit one after the after the URL. Something was busted with the one I was using. Uh after the LT, so. Oh, okay. LT slash one. one. No, just, just one. Just throw a one on the end. So loca dot LT. Right there. Uh -huh. And hit enter. Let's see. Um, Let's try that. Let me see. Wasn't it keg party? One? Oh, it's part. It's party one. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, oh, got I, it. Let's see now. always something like that. Oh, let's see. Um, I dropped the link in the chat. If you click that, let's oh, see if there's some... uh, no. hey, there we go. All right, there we go. And then the wait. Oh, let's see. Yeah, oh, and then it's sixty-five dot one twenty-nine dot one forty-eight dot forty-three. Yeah, there you go. Seems it's working out. Let's see. Very nice. All good. Great. I'll uh, register now. Thank you. All right. Excellent. Share my screen again. Okay, so I was saying there's really two things you need to do once you've signed up to kind of configure it. One is anyhow you want to add the client as a dependency. Um, then I've dropped the, the coordinate in there. And then if you want to use, if you've got like a user profile, then you'll need to add uh, like your extra paths dev. So that's, that's how I did it. Um, if you want to, you could just throw those right in the project. Um, this is for I, the way I was describing it, and maybe for the sake of this demo, it would have been a least easier just to uh, to just inline it. Um, but in the depths Eden for this project, for the demo project, I'm in the wrong project. Here we go. Uh, I could have just put in like dev, and then. Let's see how I balance. Yep. In fact, what I'll do Okay, if you clone that project and refresh it, or, or you know, pull down any changes and refresh it, you should get everything you need. So you shouldn't even have to um, 
do any depth seeding configuration. The only reason I usually do it through depth seeding is because usually this is more like a dev dependency kind of a thing. It's not something you're going to want to put like in your mainline project. Um, so uh, <clears throat> anyways, so hopefully that gives you everything you need. And then however you launch your project, you're going to add these three configuration, uh, those three environment variables. All right, so now I'm back here and um, I'll just let folks kind of spin on that for a minute. If you get stuck on anything, let me know. Um, and I'll start kind of talking about the project if that's all right. Or, or does anybody need any help with debugging anything? All right, I will take the silence as I'm wait. I'll wait for the next. I'll keep going until I hear the next question. So, when you tap in, then essentially what you can do. Possibly, oh. sorry, possibly the depths.eden is broken. Something about the the uh, the parent parentheses there is kind of unbalanced. Maybe. Uh, okay. Let me see. That right, is that so kidding. nice, by the way, Be, doing all that live. So lovely. We love to do that. <laughs> I think that, okay, that was it right there. All right, now update. I guarantee you it'll work this time. <laughs> so just to show like how I would do it, um, you would go to something along the lines of edit configurations, new configuration. And um, in fact, here you can see my environment. Um, so you can see my username and all that. Um, and then, uh, and so you would just go new uh, closure. Uh, well, well, this is gonna be local for you. So you're just gonna do, call it whatever you want. And then just down here in the environment variables, this is if you're using IntelliJ and, and with cursive, then you just add those right here and then go ahead and launch it from there. So at this point, if you've checked out the project and refreshed it, everything should work as long as you have these environment variables set. Let us hope. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, and and so, so I'll kind of move forward a little bit. And then, yeah, if anyone is, is stuck or anything, let me know. Um, the basic idea of Keg Party, though, is that you can now tap to a standalone server and like interact with your data as a stream. So here, it's just this is the, all the code in the project outside of the ability to tap in. And so I've got this little uh, schema set up with Molly. And so I'm actually going to jump down here to this code form. And so if I tap that, hey, there it is. Um, you know, it showed up. And then I can tap some other stuff, like a matrix. I can make a really tall thing. I can also delete stuff if I don't like that. Same thing, I'd have a wide one just to test the ability to, you know, to go wide. Hey, somebody else is here. I see it. And then um, to show some of the HTMX features, so if you do a, a sample with a Molly generator, it makes like, I think it makes 10 by default. So I'm going to do that. And so notice they all dispute out. I'm going to do that a bunch. Okay. So I've now got 200 messages. I'm going to refresh my own browser because I want to show how it looks if you, from a fresh start. So refresh, did that happen? I guess it did happen. Uh, there we go. And so, hey, there we go. We got another one. 
Um, and so then <clears throat> what you can do is you can scroll and you can effectively, see how fast I can scroll there? So that's kind of cool. Now the thing in my mouse is got the, I got the inertia going. So I can scroll all the way down. And what's cool about this is that using HTMX, I'm only loading 10 elements at a time. You don't know that I'm doing that. Now, if I go over here to uh, to the, the, um, the local tunnel, I suspect I'm not going to have as good of an experience, not because, well, because of a, uh, Because it seems like normally, uh, there we go. Okay, there we go. Normally, local tunnel, I, I it, it's it's a little laggy, but it's not terrible. This morning, I don't know if there's like a lot of people hitting the servers. It does not seem to be super awesome right now, um, but at least you know you can see this is what it looks like. And then when you hit the bottom, and I've got this hidden by. Okay, so here you can see it's spinning because it's waiting for the response, and so you can actually see the lazy loading, lazy loading in action. Um, and so we just got 10 more. I would fully expect if I actually had like a real server that we were all hitting, that the performance would be very good. Um, it's just, this is definitely a, like a local tunnel networking thing going on. Um, and so that's sort of the, you know, with extreme lag. Uh, but again, if I'm over in my own browser where I'm just tapping locally, where I'm not actually going through any kind of a network, um, <clears throat> you know, the performance is excellent. You actually never even see the uh, you never see you never even see like the loading oh, oh wait um some of the other cool features uh, and by the way so so Dazlu got in has anybody else been able to have success yet that's trying um if like will you see um, warnings or failures in the REPL if uh, I if, got it like... to I I just got it to work now um so that's that's great. Uh, if anyone need help so configuring the environment variables in Emacs, then just uh, tell me and I'll help you with that. But everything is working for me now. Thank you. Yes, if you're using Emacs, don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ask me if you need uh, Emacs help. Or what's, your, what's your IDE, Adam? Uh, Emacs. But I like I was yeah. trying to launch it through, from uh, just from a a terminal, and then I connect oh. in. Oh yeah, you um, should be able to I'll do environment just... variables, and then. Yeah, I can yeah, it, uh, say how to do it in uh, in uh, the chat. Okay, is that sure. all right, Adam? Yeah, that's fine. Sweet. Yeah. So the idea then is, um, so not only so you, you can scroll. Uh, some other things you can do that are kind of cool is you can copy anything. So there's a little toast you can see there on the bottom. It says copied, so I can go to my REPL and paste that in. Uh, you can, so I can copy anything, you know, here. You can, uh, this is supposed to be a drill. I couldn't find like a good icon for this on Fun Awesome. So maybe let me could submit something, I don't know. But so you, if you drill, you can actually navigate. So it knows this, this is a vector. So maybe I only want like row three and then I can drill down again into row like, you know, four or whatever. That one's not super interesting. But if you're ever like working with some live production code, you may have some like really big data structure and you're like, was it, you know, you do like a get in and it comes back to nil. You're like, oh, I forgot. I need to get in like zero and then, you know, whatever is a pain to navigate. And so you can go here and you can drill in here. And maybe all I care about is like just the address. So I can uncheck these guys and just do that. Or maybe I do just want to drill down to the address and get that. And so then once I have this information and I copy it and, you know, go over here in my REPL and do whatever I want with it. Um, <clears throat> and so that's kind of the idea of the drill feature. Uh, you can trash anything. So you can just kind of go through here and get rid of whatever you want. Um, oftentimes what I'll do is have a whole bunch of stuff in the stack and I just want to trash it all. And this is like a global trash can. And so, but maybe you want to keep a couple things. So maybe I like this one or this one, trash that. And then it will uh, trash. Notice. It doesn't, it only trashes my stuff. It's not trashing Dazlu's stuff. So I can't like brute force, like blow away other people's stuff. Um, and then, uh, so that's kind of the main features of the tap stream. And so that's pretty useful. And then there's also this idea of channels. And so I can go create a channel, which I think I remember my icon. Yeah. And so I'm going to create a channel 
and so my channel. And then it goes and puts me right here in the channel, and then I can do another tap here. And then this, and this is only going to show up in this channel. If somebody else were to join me, they'd be able to see what's in the channel as well. Um, I can go and enter another channel. So I see Tim is in HTMX, or at least that's where uh, that's where his user is. So I can go here. And then since this channel is empty, I can now delete it. And so then again, I can uh, do all the uh, you know do stuff here. And then if I go back over to public, um, I have everything that was in my public channel, and so everything is kind of partitioned off, just like a regular chat application. Um, and then again, every once in a while, just kind of wipe everything and start over. Um, I can also, this is more just like a debugging tool, but I can see like who all is connected, um, like who, who has a session. So it looks like these are all the people that are currently active. Um, I think the star is next to the people that are like me. I, it's been a little while since I developed this part, but this is more just like a an admin page sort of thing. Um, and then let me just check the chat and make sure there's nothing to... Okay. Like some debugging stuff. Uh, and so, yeah, so anyway, that, that's kind of the basic idea. So you have all the channel navigation that you would normally expect. One thing you can do is you can collapse over here. Normally, normally when I'm working by default is everything collapse since it's usually just me doing it. Um, and then uh, I can log out. I can, you know, log back in. And uh, so that's basically, I think, I have a little crib sheet here. Really. Look at my crib sheet and see if there's any features that I did not discuss. Yeah, I showed how you can kind of doom scroll if you have enough, if you have enough bandwidth, uh, copy drill, delete, favorite, bulk delete. Um, and then, yeah, so I think that's pretty much everything. So by the way, I've got two different IDEs running here. This is the actual client project. So this would be like kind of simulating your regular project that you would use keg party in. And then I have the actual keg party project itself. And we can dive into some of the details of this. That's what I thought I would do next is actually kind of get into some of the code. Um, and But normally when I'm running the keg party project, I just run it from the command line. I don't actually usually open my IDE and have it, have it, you know, have the actual project up and running. I just run it from, you know, depths or whatever. And, and you know, it works great that way. Um, so that's the tool. Uh, besides Dazlu, has anybody else had success tapping in or want to or want to try? If not, we can I can jump in, start jumping into the source code or whatever. Uh, I mean, I'd like to try, but it gives me a 404 for from tap server. I am pretty sure I configured it uh, not in the correct way, like way. So let's see. And Olav, you were you were uh, you were successful, right? Uh, yes, if you change the URL to keg dash party one. Ah, no, I was uh, uh, able to register. I wasn't able to, but yeah, like, ah, okay, this one. Okay, sure. Keg party. Yeah, I think actually, yes. Uh, ah, wait, but what about, and I have to, pro yeah, no, I think I did it actually. I'll try it uh, one more time. Mm -hmm. And one thing, by the way, um, just, just to show a couple of things, I, I guess, first of all, yeah, anyone that needs any help tapping in or wants to try, please, please pipe up and we can, we can chime in and we'll try to, uh, we'll try to get that working. Hey, Adam, you did it. Send something else. Make it really interesting. Send like the metabase code base. <laughs> I'll, I'll come up with something. Come up with something. So I'll just kind of watch the stream and then kind of go back to the uh, go back to the presentation elements. So that's basically what Keg Party is. Let me go back to my little crib sheet I put together last night. So originally I was going to do the party demo after I showed everything, but we did it kind of interactively. So maybe that's a great thing. That's good good feedback. Everybody's going to want to do it up front. Um, Okay, so now we're on to kind of my notes on architecture, and I think I'm going to need to make this bigger for everybody. Let's get all one page. Uh, 
Okay, so just a couple of notes. These are my, this is my PowerPoint equal in here, so I'll make sure I didn't forget anything. Um, so yeah, completely server rendered. There's no, almost, I shouldn't say no, there's almost no JavaScript. So let's look at the actual JavaScript. So source is all CLJ, CLJ. In resources, I have a little bit of JavaScript right here. This is all the Java. So this is all the front end code for the whole application, all the, all the actual JavaScript. I have a uh, toggle sidebar. That's the thing that does this. Maybe, maybe it will make sense to zoom in a little bit uh, for this part where we're, oh yeah, that is great, thanks. All right, here we go. So this is, so yeah, I've got 39 lines of JavaScript for my entire application. I feel pretty good about that. Um, the, uh, the, the sidebar toggle is one. Uh, the password check, when you check it, wants to make sure your password is the same when you enter your password and then re-enter the password. And then uh, the toast that gets shown. <clears throat> so that's that's all the JavaScript in the whole application. Everything else is server rendered. Um, and so I, I think that's pretty cool. I, I find myself, I, I probably hear, hear people talk about like JavaScript fatigue and framework fatigue. Um, you know, usually if you're writing something, whether it's React or even Reframe, you know, you've got like a model view controller and you've got code all over the place and it's quite difficult to follow. Um, I really like the ability to just render everything on the back end. So there's my, so there's all the JavaScript and the whole application show that. Um, the back end actually has an interesting pattern. Um, let's take a look at some of this. So there's two main packages, generic and keg party. And I'll jump into generic first. So when I was first messing with this, I saw that there was a, let me make sure I'm following the. So the basic idea when you launch is that most of keg party is driven by web sockets, not by typical, uh, you know, put post get kind of, you know, typical HTML, uh, yeah, typical HTML verbs or HTTP verbs. Um, Here's kind of how it works. So the actual web server is right here. And you have various routes that you can see for the different pages. So slash is my login. This is also where you post. This is this is the one endpoint that the tap actually hits. Yay, HTML does not render, Adam. Let's fix that. <laughs> um, and so this is where you post anything. And really, I should even go back further just a little bit to the, I have a client jar. This is the entire REST client right here. Um, and so really you can simulate everything just via straight up, like like uh, just, just posting straight to an endpoint. So you just post the slash. <clears throat> I should make this bigger too. So post that data. In fact, if this is in your, project, and it should be, you could even include this if you want to debug, just pass in a, uh, a map with these values, username, password, host, port, and then data, and then it should post. You don't actually need to tap in, so this bypasses the actual tap. All tap, tap in does is package that up into a function and tap it. Um, let's see. What is your username, Olav? Uh, my username is Olav Fossa. It's just my name. <laughs> yeah, I suspect, I, I have a strong suspicion. I've done this once with Local Tunnel in the past. I think that the networking is probably not awesome with that. I think it just hasn't hit the server yet. So I'm not sure what's going on with that. Um, if I do this again, I just didn't have the cycles to do it. I really should like spin up an instance in the cloud or something that we can all hit. Um, so, but the basic idea, mind. okay, yeah. So essentially these are the routes. And so I use a uh, uh, RIA tip, which I think is great. And the routes, it's actually very straightforward. You can see what all the main pages are. Um, you know, there's the feed page, the login page, the logout page and so on. Um, anything that's a get is gonna return HTML content. And then, um, and then it's just hypermedia. And so, uh, that's the basic idea on how things are rendered. Um, and then it basically has, I've got a pages namespace. 
And so these are all the main pages in the application. Let's make it bigger again. And so we've got the sign up page, which you've seen, the login page, which you've seen. This is the feed page right here. Um, and then uh, the tap detail, that's where you do the drilling. And clients, I show that. That's where you can see everyone that's connected. One thing that's really cool about this is with HTML or HTMX that is really nice is ever, since everything is server rendered, it's very easy to just take your take your information, wrap it as a page, which wrap as page just converts it to HTML, and then you can just spit it straight out into a file. And so that I can go and find this uh, sign up, and then make it pretty, and then I can open it in my browser, and I can see exactly what I'm building. And so you could hypothetically when you and, and actually this is what I do frequently if I'm trying to develop a new page since it's all this HTML and styling. You can make the page independently, and then when you're ready, you just go paste it into your into your code. So I know that, uh, all right, I made this just using HTML skills. I, you know, I made this sign-up page. I can just take this, and I can go back over to my source code, and if your browser has the, or your tool has a feature, you can just paste it in, convert it, and boom, you've got Hiccup. And so, what's really nice about this is you don't need to know, you know, React or MUI or any of the other component frameworks. All you need to know is HTML and styling. You can do all that completely independently. If this was like a production, like a corporation that was trying to build something, you could actually hire people that are just web designers. And it's like, hey, all you need to do is go write HTML pages. You don't need to worry about, you know, making mocks and Figma or whatever. And then we go turn out using, you know, material design or AntD or whatever, turn that into a web page. You just give us the HTML that you've developed. We can paste it in. Boom, we've got it. And then we can start hacking away on it. If you want to iterate, if you want it back, then I can just render the page out as HTML again, and it makes a very nice little loop there. So that's one thing I really kind of like about it. Um, so let's actually go look at the feed page. This is the interesting one. Um, so here's our nav bar right here at the top. And so these are all, I mean, most of this should be fairly self-explanatory or apparent, but it's very nice because it's very easy to see a one-to-one -one relationship between what you're seeing here, HTML that you would see on a website. Like I, I use Bootstrap for all my styling on Bootstrap and then what you see over here in the page. And then you can edit anything you want. Uh, like, um, let me pick something that's a little, most of it's all icons. So, but what I could do is, um, let's see. That says delete and start tap. So let me just change that a little bit. Refresh that. One thing that's a little bit different from doing something like uh, like 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 a like a re, like like a close your script type IDE where you're using shadow is it's not going to immediately refresh. You may have to refresh the page or navigate navigate away and back. But um, notice my change is now live. It's going to be very small for all of you, but uh, that tooltip changed. Um, or maybe what I want to do is instead of having an icon, I could do, over here and if I refresh that, there it is. So, um, so it's quite interactive. This is probably the one of the small nits I have with HTML, HTMX, but it's, but it's still not, it's nothing that bothers me that much is if you need to, uh, okay. is, is, you know, when you make your changes and save them, it doesn't immediately refresh the browser. So, you know, you, but if you ever like you know navigate away and back or something, then it'll uh, it'll it'll serve it back out. So that is a small thing to be aware of. Um, so there's your nav bar. Uh, here's the modal that shows up when you create a channel. Let's see if I can find something that's a little more interesting. Uh, here is a code block. So this is what you see in here. And so this actually under the covers, I use highlight JS to. Um, to, to render all the code so it looks nice. And so when it loads in, it just loads the script as part of that. And then it and then it uh 
and then it highlights just that element. And so highlight.js is part of the page, so it loads up with the page. So I'm not reloading highlight every time. It's just going to um, just just uh, re-highlight just the element that I loaded. Um, and so here you can see this is kind of how I insert some of the JavaScript stuff. The scrolling, let's see if I can find that. So recent taps. Here we have like a page limit and a cursor. And so that's what happens here. And then once you get to the end of the recent tap, so these are the first 10 that load, like I said, when you get to the end of those, then what it does is it inserts a, 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 a hidden div and that div has no content. But then what it does is it says that as soon as it intersects the viewport, it is going to swap the outer HTML with uh, the results of this HX get. And so essentially it's going to take the div, it's going to swap it, and it's going to pop in 10 new items. And so that's just, that's how you do some of the kind of the lazy techniques using HTMX. One thing that's, and so anyways, yeah, so here's all the code for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the page feed, which is kind of cool. In fact, I looked last night, um, so if I just count the source code lines for all of the front end code, it's only it's 456 lines. So I, I realize it's not the most sophisticated website in the world, but at the same time, not a lot of code, and it does quite a bit. So I think it's kind of handy. I, I would imagine if you're using a lot of more framework heavy applications, like if you were to do this in you know React or Reframe or whatever, I suspect that between you know the, the, you know having a, a model view controller and everything else, you're probably going to have a lot more code, and it's probably going to be a lot harder to think about. Um, but really everything is quite simple. It's just a matter of you render the page. When you click something on the page, you call some endpoint, and then it just updates certain elements in line. There is one thing that architecturally that it actually, I think is actually kind of interesting about this application that you don't see in a typical HTMX application. Most HTMX applications, I think just because it's kind of how people pick, it up, pick them up, is there your typical, uh, you know, one user is interacting with one page. And so there's not really any need to, for coordination between visitors and so or between users. And so because of that, most of the applications you're going to be using are going to be like an HX, HX post or get, which basically is saying from this element, when something happens, do a get or a post or a delete, and then swap in whatever the result is. What happens instead here is, Let's see. I use the web service ex web socket extension. And so here we have the speed page. And so at the very top of the page, you just say HXEXT web socket connect. And then it's going to go to the back end, establish a web socket connection. And then everywhere where I have a WS send, when I click rather than doing a post or whatever, it's going to send this value over the socket. And so um, over the web socket. And so then what happens is on the back end, so this really is kind of everything there is to see about the front end. Then what happens on the back end is, once it connects, then when it receives the, uh, there's your client. This is just, um, this is the connect logic to, to grab a new client. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Um, so the on text is the typical message that you're going to get. And so someone's going to send this message in. The session has the information on the user. And then you've got this message. And then everything is based on commands and events. And so you're going to have some command. You're going to grab the command. You're going to turn that into a keyword. And then from there, you're going to dispatch the command. And so really, that's where almost every, that's how almost all the logic works in this, is most of the time when you click something or do something, it's actually sending a command over the WebSocket. But as far as ingress, you could do it over the WebSocket or you could do like a post or whatever. But then what happens is, this is a single multi-method. And that's all down here in this, this generic package. And then the commands themselves are implemented right here. And so you can see all of the things like, okay, when, when, it, when a message arrives, that's this command right here. That's tap message. And so what tap message does is the first thing it does is it uh, goes and grabs your user information. 
and then it creates the tap. And so this just stores that into a local um, a SQLite database, uh, creates the tap message, and then that's basically it. The events, and so everything goes to a command. So WebSocket sends a message in, uh, it turns into a command, uh, the command gets dispatched, and then some event happens. This is one of those, like, this is kind of like a work in progress, and it's kind of like, well, it works pretty well, so I don't know how much, aside from just my own academic interest about how much further I'm going to take it. But really what you should be doing is putting this on, like, some kind of a, a message bus or, you know, something like that, and then uh, pull the events off of that or be pulling the database. But for right now, it just does it directly. And then on the back end, when a tap arrives, this is the message that was that was created. Oh, here's my context. And then here is the data that was created from the command. And then finally, I create new HTML. And so all I do is uh, an HTML just comes straight out of a, straight out of Hiccup. And then I say, all right, for everybody in my channel. So if you were to send this here, it would get list everyone that's in the channel right now. <clears throat> and then it would get all the clients for that, so all the WebSocket clients, and then it would broadcast the HTML. So in this case, the actual HTML that gets sent back over the wire is just this right here. And so, um, and it does an HX swap out of band. And so what it's saying is, I received this message, I know where I need to send it to, and so I'm gonna send that, and then when it lands, it is going to take this generate HTML and it's gonna put it in after the beginning of the, of the location that it originated. Um, and let's take a look at what this actually looks like. So the notification, so this is what it's putting it in. So the notifications pane is just this big white area here. And it has an ID of catalog. So back there in the events, what it's doing is it's saying, all right, so take that, 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 that element from the page. And then after the beginning of that element, so basically it's going to insert it at the front, put this code block in there. And, and then here's what a code block, and we already looked, showed what a code block looks like. Um, so I know this kind of a you know a fire hose uh, explanation, but essentially whenever you do anything, it sends a command to the back. It typically stores that in the database, and then it creates an event. And almost always that event is going to, hey look at that we got something. All right, hold up we got something. Um, and so uh, it takes that event, and that event typically is just broadcasting over the socket um, an HTML fragment. And then that gets swapped in place however it needs to happen. And that's a key element of HTMX is, in this case, you know, normally with plain old HTML, I'd have to refresh this entire page, where instead what's going on here is when I send a tap, it's only going to insert like one element at the top for the thing that I sent. Um, let's see, I went a little out of order on this, but, uh, let's see. So yeah, you seek a life for everything. Uh -huh. Mark, maybe, uh, let us mention that we have 20 minutes now, the official time. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it will be nice to kind of leave a few minutes to kind of chat about broader topics and recap. Yeah. And then afterwards, anybody who wishes to stay can stay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, then one yeah. I can always send this trip sheet out if anyone's interested, but really I think I've covered just about everything. I, I demoed the app, kind of went through the code. Uh, you know, again, all written HTML. One thing, yeah, at, at, again at a very high level, things I like about HTMX is that it prefers locality of behavior, which means that you're storing all your state somewhere in your page. You click the you click the button. It goes to the back end, and your logic and your view are really co-located because it's all baked right in, which is kind of nice. It makes it really nice for testing, too. You don't really need to do end-to-end -end testing as much. Instead, you can just uh, go in here, and all of your page in your pages, you know, if you expect a certain change 
to modify the data, then you could just use something like Hickory to parse the, the return structure and make sure everything's there. Um, aside from that, I think that's about all I've got. Uh, and like I said, for to-dos, you know, it'd be nice to make it more of a true event-driven system, but you know, for small scale personal project, I don't think it's that big of a deal right now. Um, anything that you see that doesn't look awesome, like, oh man, like this, this really could be a little more slick, um, like some of the spacing here. That again is totally on me as uh, I just need to be better at my, you know, writing better styling. Um, and uh, I think that's about it. So I guess I'll just pause right there and see if anyone has any questions or anything. That was so inspiring, Mark. And you know, as somebody who doesn't write HTMX yet, it really helped me to kind of figure out what I should learn and, and why. And really thank you for this, uh, you know, this kind of teaching through the code. And would you like Mark to tell a little bit about your hopes of creating future tools or anything you're dreaming about or something you would like to create or demonstrate in the future? Oh, man. Um, you know, I would love to see something like this becoming more, uh, you know, it'd be kind of cool to actually maybe put this on a server and have it more prevalent. The thing I think really right here is what are all the things that you might normally do as you're debugging data? And like, like one thing you might normally do is drill into the data. And so it would be really nice to actually have more, you know, something more along those lines. Actually, one thing that thinking about Adam's work is the ability to do charts and graphs. Um, if any of you have seen eCharts, eCharts is this really cool library that um, essentially is all data driven. So it'd be really easy to like tap data in. And maybe if you tapped in like, you know, XY plot data, to have like a chart thing and automatically chart it. And again, you could do nearly everything in the back end. There's really almost no front end code required to do that. Um, so that's something I would hope for. In terms of on a more grand scope, my experience has so far has been that almost any, if not any UI project, any front end project I've ever worked on, I believe actually HTML or HTMX would work pretty well for it. And you'd be able to get things done you know, faster and have it be easier to understand and maintain. That's that's kind of been been kind of my experience. Um, let's see, did somebody send something big. Somebody did send something big. <laughs> Oops, there that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> that's all right. Notice handles it. That's supposed time. to be a chessboard. Okay, yeah, well, send me a chessboard. Well, um, <laughs> yeah, so. It, and, and really, I think about things like with visual, like, like my, my original love was actually, I, I'm like, like Adam, I'm mechanical engineering by trade. I got into doing numerical analysis. Some of the stuff like, you know, Scilog and other things, I haven't been doing as much data science in a while, but a lot of the, you know, the, the charting and graphing and interactive tools, I could see all of that being done um, using some sort of a, a, a tool like this. And it could be quite simple. I don't think we need to write an entire like fancy front end framework for it. We can just, we could just render everything as hiccup, you know, pass it to the front end, you're good to go, so. Any questions, anybody to Mark or any comments or thoughts briefly? Like, honestly, I don't really have questions, but it would be nice to spend my own time diving into code base <laughs> because like, yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting project. Uh, feels like uh, I can also learn how to structure something on top of HTMX because I had no idea, honestly. I'm so used to reagent and all this kind of stuff. So, yeah. You know, I've, I've done a decent amount of reagent and then some, you know, some reframe and stuff like that. And, you know, philosophically, like I, I will say like philosophically, like I, I, I'm pretty comfortable with reagent. Philosophically reframe is great, but ultimately it's built on top of these abstractions around 
you know, you've got effects and co-effects and you've got a, 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 you know, like a model file and a view file. And quite frequently in a traditional spa, you've got a, a large amount of code maintaining state on the front end that has to somehow stay synchronized with the code on the back end. And it becomes very complicated. And for a large number of applications, I, I think as developers, we tell ourselves like, oh, this application, it's different. It's like so complicated. And really it's not. I think most of the things we do are fairly straightforward user interfaces, even if they look really cool. And really what we can do is have a, we've got some kind of backend data source, whether it's, you know, something awesome like Atomic or something, you know, generic like SQL. We, we can write our queries and we know that those are producing the things we want. And that really from a data science standpoint is critical because usually it's like, hey, <laughs> I love it, Adam. Great, great, great chart. <laughs> so um, anyways, and, and so, you know, we know the kind of things that we are producing. And so then it's just a matter of how do I take that step and draw that to, to view it? And the cool thing about this is if you're used to, you know, plain old like 90s HTML, it's usually pretty easy to say, I've got this piece of data that I pulled out of my database, turn it into HTML and then render it. And, you know, the, the, the problems with old school HTML are, well, if I change that, I got to refresh like the whole page. Well, now you don't. Now it's just, oh, now I want to click this thing. I can use HTML just to update the things that I want to. And so I find it to be a much, much simpler mental model. It's really like if you can, if you can take your data from your database or your data source, render it, push that straight to the user, and then any interaction people want, it's, you know, they touch it and then it just updates, just the element on the back end updates it. So yeah. One thing I do too, as far as the project goes, so frequently when I run the project, here's what I almost, here, here's kind of my normal mode of operations is, uh, and it's probably even in my history. So typically I've got the project clone, you know, just sitting on my, on my local, on my local machine. And so I just go in, uh, you know, and I fire up closure dash, dash X, keg party main run. And I run that and, you know, it comes up. And then at that point, as long as I've got my, my, my lines plugged into my environment, I can use this in any project I'm working on. Um, if any of you use any of the other tools out there, like I can never remember the names, uh, when I, uh, this, I figured somebody might ask me this, like Portal, Rebel, Reveal. Um, you know, I, I thought somebody might ask like, hey, why don't you use those? Or why didn't you use them in the first place? They're all really good. They're probably even better, I don't know. Um, uh, but you know, it's fun to write your own thing every once in a while. But you know, if you're looking for a visual tool, yeah, give it a try and let me know what you think. I, I'd love some feedback, but like I always just run it locally. You know, it's even though it was designed to be kind of a, or the, the, the grand idea was this, you know, cloud-based, we all tap in kind of thing. Um, and maybe, you know, maybe you want somebody wanted me to, you know, donate some cycles on, on, a, on a server, I would do that. But for right now, it works great to just run it locally, try it out, let me know what you think. I really like the idea that it's a standalone process in a browser with its own database. So like if you're using, you know, reveal usually to, you know, to kill your, your application, the whole thing goes down kind of thing. And so that's, that's kind of convenient. Um, yeah. So uh, we have like nine minutes now. And while well, you know, we keep chatting about Keg Party, maybe a question I wish to ask all of you is about future meetings and about how we could continue this journey we began with HTMX projects and what else we are hoping to learn. Should we have more basic HTMX sessions or more advanced or anything you would like to find it? you know, on future meetups. But yeah, I didn't want to stop the keg party discussion, uh, just like a thought for the coming few minutes of something we could discuss. And also I'm curious to ask you, Mark, about, you know, more about your mechanical engineer hopes, <laughs> what you may imagine from that old sentiment of yours, you may imagine happening, the kind of tool you wish to see yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, so yeah, my first love is numerical analysis. And um, 
it would be really cool to have some kind of a, I don't know, I got to think about that. If there's some interactive like ODE solver or something where you enter in your parameters, you click the button and it does all the charts and all that. Almost like a, like a notebook style thing, like you see with Jupiter. I think about that some more. I haven't done that stuff in a while, but it was, I mean, it's what really got me into software development in the first place. I do think there's a lot of potential for, you know, we see things like Jupyter Notebooks, for example. I think something like this could potentially, you know, th there's a there's a massive army of people out there writing, you know, writing Jupyter Notebooks and stuff. But certainly if you wanted to make something similar, I bet you could do something like this. And, you know, the nice thing about it is it's very agnostic, uh, the technology agnostic. There's very little, you know, you can write it in whatever whatever language you want. And of course, for us, we want to write it in closure because well, you're awesome. Uh, so as far as the HTMX thing, a couple ideas. I mean, I don't know if you want to have another meetup where we just write like a real simple hello world and or if somebody has an idea, we could actually like code it up in an hour and a half. See what it looks like, just like hackathon it. That would be great. Yeah, regarding, uh, you know, Jupyter Notebooks, this, you know, popular tool, I just had a, a chat with a friend and, and we thought possibly it would be useful to bring that as part of our habit of closure people, being able to generate those things as well, even though that is might not be our favorite tool, just as a way of communicating with our Python colleagues and so on. And, mm -hmm. and then possibly a few of us will come back to this uh, old existing Clojupiter project and try to make it part of our workflow. And then, yeah, as far as, an, as I understand, we can embed HTMX there and hiccup generated HTML inside uh, our Jupyter notebooks with a closure kernel. So that is something we might explore in a future meetup. And then possibly I'll ask you then again, Mark, about your mechanical uh, hopes and <laughs> how to make it kind of re uh, relevant. And yeah. Uh, does anybody wish to comment about anything or ask anything uh, while we are kind of getting? Oh, I just want to ask Mark: Can you make a presentation MD file available somewhere? Because yeah, it, it had some interesting uh, notes. Uh, so, like, I would like to reflect on it. <laughs> Let me. Where's a good place to? I mean, I guess I could just commit this to the repo. There's nothing. Yeah, nothing super secret in there. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll just push that on. I'll just put that on the repo and make it from the page or something. Mm -hmm. In fact, yeah, come back right back to that. One thing I did want to show real quick, this is more just a teaser if we if we want to do something like this. So something I do is uh, when I'm learning HTMX is I, I have this like this sample, I call it CLJ HTMX Playground project. And I think most of the stuff is checked in. Um, but this would be a good place if we wanted to just do more of a like, hey, let's just like make a really easy HTMX thing. Um, and so I have like, uh, oh, where's a good one? Uh, like I was thinking like, how do I show a modal HTMX, you know, kind of thing. And so, and see notice it updates the value of the button. And so, uh, and then, so that's a real simple, now, some of these are like 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 you know kindergarten level level applications, and so so something like this we could always do if we ever wanted to try that out. Uh, one thing that I thought could be kind of interesting is uh, that's not what I wanted. I wanted this. I was actually looking at a like because because a lot of times people think HTMX is like oh you know it's only for like you know little baby forms and stuff. You can't do anything complicated with it. And so I think hopefully Keg Party showed that yeah, you can actually make some pretty cool stuff with HTMX. And certainly Adam's uh, bad spreadsheets really show some cool stuff here with HTMX. 
So here you can do like this. I made this checkout workflow. Um, I just kind of was experimenting with it. So it's like, okay, well, what if I was that made something to make a game? So, you know, I want to choose like a, uh, you know, I'm going to play a game tonight. What do I want? I want to, I'm going to, it's a party game. All right. I have at least like, I want something that's at least rated like six or higher. And I want there to be, you know, I want it to be a popular game. So let's say there's like 5,000 owners. And then, oops, and then, uh, and when I do that, you know, all these get updated. So I can do like, you know, notice that, oh, there's none that have the higher rating. So apparently people don't like party games as much. And so I can choose a game, hey, code name. Yeah, everybody, actually everybody likes Captain Sonar. That's a good one. And so submit that. And it takes me to the next step in my workflow. There's this little summary here. And then to show kind of like a validation, no, normally you do this on the filters on the previous one, but to show you can do some validation, I'm gonna say, all right, my youngest player is like five. It says, oh, you're under the recommended age. Your five-year-old should not be playing Captain Sonar. And then, so, you know, say that, oh, hey, you're the right age to play the game. I didn't do anything forward with this. This is just more, again, demonstrating the concept. But again, this zero JavaScript, this is all HTMX. And I think that most people would be like, no way, man, I don't believe that. But yeah, so just an idea for future stuff. So. Uh, you know, now I'm interested in uh, where is the limit like and how far it can be pushed. So I guess I'll start uh, hacking around. <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, that's sort of a, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know, man, no way, how would it work? But I think that I'll have to add, make Adam make the ASCII art for this. But I think that with the spa, essentially, you've got the spike where you load the page and you see this big old spike where you're loading the whole web page. Then as you navigate around, what I typically see people doing is they actually are shoveling out a massive amount of their database. So you, know, you, go, to, you go to this page and all of a sudden, boom, it pulls down like all your users or all of your, your client data or all your whatever. So there's this big spike where you're pulling data from all these different databases. And then once it's all loaded, then it does all the, all the logic on the front end and then it's pretty snappy. And so, but then even then, every time you interact with your back end, there's gonna be a little more interaction. So you see kind of these, these spikes followed by kind of some subtle, you know, smaller blips. HTMX, I think is more like when you load it very small, you know, it's, that's going to be way smaller. And then at that point, every time you go to a new view, you know, you, you don't have everything cached on the front. And so you're going to see like these more like little blips. And then every time you do any interaction you choose to do with HTMX, you're going to have another server round trip. So again, I think what you're going to see is a much more like a steady state, noisy operation where with the spa, you have these huge blips and with a little with a lot more quiescence in between. And personally, I think that you can actually get a lot further with HTMX in most cases. That's just me. So. Beautiful. Yeah, so we are now around the official time. And maybe, Mark, you would like to say some concluding words, anything you would like to kind of say at the end. And then after. Sure, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, really, I think the main thing is just uh, I, I hope everybody was impressed with the, the, the keg party tool. And I hope you'll try it out. Um, and then I guess really I have two, two outcomes. Hope you'll just give it a shot. And if you want to making improvements, I'd love any pull requests. Uh, and then the other big one is, I hope people are starting to see what you can do with HTMX. And when you have a chance, you know, Greenfield project or find ways to introduce it to an existing project, I hope you'll do that. I think that you'll find yourself very pleasantly surprised by how much less code you can write and how much easier it is to maintain everything. So inspiring, really. Thank you so much, Mark, and everybody for this conversation. We will now say goodbye to our listeners and uh, possibly keep chatting for some time. So to our listeners, see you on the next times. <laughs>